Thank you everybody um, for joining us. We're very excited to have everyone here from all, all over the world. Um, this is our second webinar in the series that we're doing for this year. Um, this one is focused on health and welfare of uh, big cats that are bred in captivity for commercial purposes. Um, my name is Kath, I am the campaign coordinator for Blood Lions and with me is uh, Dr. Louise Duvall who is our campaign manager. Hello, <laughs> it's nice to not see everybody. <laughs> E-meet e you, I love that term. E-meet e you, meet you, yes. <laughs> virtual meeting you. <laughs> yes. So we will we will be chatting through and um, this will be a little bit different to the last webinar where um, the last one was more of a discussion. Um, Louise is, is kind of the, the, the um, real mind here with welfare so I'm going to be posing a few questions to her and we'll hear from some um, uh, professionals in the industry as well. So, Lou, what I think to start off with um, is the simplest of simple questions. What do we mean? What do we mean when we talk about animal welfare? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think it is really how an animal copes with um, the conditions in which it lives. And especially when we talk about big cats um, that aren't really supposed to be in captivity. So it's, it really, re welfare refers to the state of an animal, which includes both its physical as well as its mental state. Um, so there is an internationally recognized five freedoms um, and it's recognized that any wild or other animal under the physical control of people, whether on a temporary or a permanent basis, should at a minimum be afforded these five freedoms. Um, and they were actually developed in, um, I think it was 1979, and it was developed for agricultural livestock. So it isn't really developed for wild animals, but much more with agriculture in mind. Um, but it was a very good first st step. Um, but it is, as you can see, it's a freedom from thirst, hunger, malnutrition, freedom of discomfort, freedom of pain, injury, disease, fear of distress, um, and freedom to express a normal behavior. Um, so it is predominantly sort of on the physical welfare side and to a much lesser degree on the psychological well-being of of animals and I think we've we've really started to understand a, a lot more about uh, the the fact that animals are also able to experience uh, emotions and stress um, and have a consciousness so I think that is something we need to take in mind as well and there is an update uh, at the five domain model uh, which does include that sort of more psychological side. Um, so these are the kind of things and considerations that we need to keep in mind when we are breeding and keeping, for example, lions and other big cats in captivity. Um, but also when we transport those animals or when they're being sold and even when they're being slaughtered. I'm just, I'm just going to jump in here and do a little bit of admin. We've had a few more people um, join us. Something that I did forget to say, folks, is there is a Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to pose a question to Louise that we will answer at the end of this webinar, given that we have some time, hopefully we will, um, please use that Q&A function. If we don't get to the questions during the webinar, we collate all those questions, answer them, and send everybody a document within the next week. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, second thing with, with raised hands, you are able to raise your hand, but as I said, we'll only be taking questions afterwards, um, and we would prefer if they came in the Q&A format, if that's all right. Otherwise, the chat box is there for you if you'd like to um, let us know your thoughts and, and um, give us some feedback on the presentation. That would be amazing. So thank you, everybody. Back to, um, back to welfare, as we were saying. So 
the, the, the five freedoms and the five domains is very interesting to me because, as you say, they were developed for um, agricultural domesticated farm animals and, not, and we are now trying to, to adapt them to fit wild animals that are being kept in captivity, which is not anything that, that they were designed to do to keep a wild animal um, in captivity. So from a very basic view, welfare is how well the animal is looked after. Um, so it, it must be quite hard um, to enforce something like this. So who is responsible for the management and enforcement of welfare in South Africa? Well, that, that's a very good question. And it's a very complicated question at the same time, because traditionally all matters of animal welfare in South Africa have been regarded, uh, particularly within our national government as falling within the scope of agriculture. So now that is the Department of Agricul uh, Agriculture, Rural Development and Land Reform. It's such a mouthful. Um, whereas a lot of the permitting and um, the legislation fall under the Department of Environmental Affairs or Environment, Forestry and Fisheries. Um, and they sort of go, well, welfare is not our mandate, that falls under agriculture. Agriculture goes, no, it's not really our mandate either. And they point at the provincial nature conservation uh, uh, bodies. And I think that is where it all becomes very, very messy and complicated because we've got a top national department that is um, responsible for the legislation and then the nine provinces they kind of put that into practice and are then um, giving out permits etc so our national environmental management biodiversity act and the threatened uh, or protected species act or regulations neither of those really make provisions for welfare so when it comes to animal welfare, we have to look at our Animal Protection Act, and that falls under the ambit of agriculture. But they don't actually enforce that uh, act. So they then say, no, that is the uh, responsibility and the mandate of the NSBCA in South Africa. So they will have to look out for the, um, the sort of the enforcement um, of, of the acts. So it's all uh, very messy. I think that is really the only word you can use. Um, and we've got um, somebody um, who's actually much better at explaining this, um, Karen Trendler. Um, she was um, NSPCA Wildlife Unit Manager. Um, and so she's been working in this space for a long time and been working with those pieces of legislation. Um, I do apologize a little bit because it's not the best recording, but um, let's see what she's got to say about this uh, passing the book. Passing the buck is exactly what applies to the legislation in this country. We have nine provinces. Each province has its own provincial legislator or provincial conservation authorities that form their own legislation and they manage that separately in each province. Then you have a national department that forms policy but cannot tell the provinces what to do. Um, then there's this huge debate as to where the welfare of captive animals falls. The conservation departments will tell you, we are concerned only about conservation. We issue the permits, that's the situation. If the guys' camps are the right size, we don't have a problem. It's the welfare of those animals that then falls again through the system. We have a very strong piece of legislation in this country, the Animals Protection Act, which, if you read the act, covers all animals from insects right the way through to wildlife and domestic stock. But the legislation and our conservation legislation and the division of captive wild animals, free-ranging wild animals, uh, like animals in production situations like intensive breeding, there are problems applying that Animal Protection Act. The judges, the legal system, the people doing the inspections are not sensitized to welfare issues. So welfare of captive wild animals falls under Department of Agriculture. They don't have their own inspectorate. It is then up to 
NGOs like the NSPCA to go in and do the inspections and they have a hard time getting access. And again, the welfare just falls through the, the cracks. So that is really how we sort of come to the situation where we've got this massive, big line breeding industry um, and um, not any sort of welfare that's being enforced um, upon this industry. And we can go as far back as 2009 um, and it was already acknowledged by many people that the, the keeping and the breeding of, of lions in captivity uh, and keeping them healthy <clears throat> costs considerable amounts of money. Uh, costs are continuously rising, so animal welfare is, is just likely to suffer, and that is what's happening. Um, and that was at a time in 2009 when most of the captive lions were actually bred for the trophy hunting industry. So their physical appearance was really very important, was essential. Um, now many of our lions are being bred for the bone trades. So their appearance is of absolutely no consequence. So the welfare issues have just become worse and worse over time. Um, and I think it is through, that is what I was, would like to sort of focus on for this presentation is that it's at every stage of a lion or a tiger or whatever cat in captivity, a, a, every stage of its life and every step along its economic value chain um, that there are welfare issues and often they're pure animal cruelty. Um, so let's start with the cubs. Um, so many, the vast majority of cubs really in breeding facilities are taken away from their mothers um, within days and sometimes within hours of birth. Now we did sort of, sort of touch on this last week as well um, and as we were saying then some haven't even tasted their mother's milk before they are actually being taken away. Um, they're then being hand reared um, that often involved paying for volunteers um, and that sort of starts that habituation process which is so important in terms of the petting industry um, and of course those paying volunteers they bring in the money as well but those are the people, visitors like you and me. Um, I was actually at a facility not so long ago and we came in and the first thing that we were done is, you know, we were given this bottle and feed that tiger. Um, so we, the paying, the visiting public, the volunteers we don't know how to feed a cup and it can actually have disastrous consequences. And some of the cups actually die as a result. Um, I think more importantly even than that is that those cubs are fed with cow's milk um, or a formula like Espelac. Now Espelac is a formula that is actually developed for puppy dogs um, because there is no specific formula for big cats. Now a dog's nutritional requirements is very different from a cat's so it is the, the incorrect formula that these cubs are being fed. Um, it, it just doesn't give them the right nutritional value. It doesn't give them the right vitamins, the, the right um, amino acids. Um, so yeah, it's from a very early age that these animals are suffering from nutritional deficiencies. I'm sure. And you know, a, a wild lion or a wild tiger would never drink cow's milk, first of all, and they would never drink it from a synthetic teat yeah. on a plastic bottle. Um, so I can just imagine, do these, do these actions and actually bottle feeding these cubs have any um, effect on the cubs with regards to their physical and their physiological development as growing animals? Yes, and I think it is, especially those nutritional deficiencies that um, that has an, a massive impact. We as non-experts, and I include myself as well, I'm not a, a, a vet, um, we sort of see a cup like the one at the 
the, the right bottom and you think god that little thing is just so thin you can see every single little um rib but what we don't see straight away is look at the front legs they're really bendy um, so they from an early age they actually develop all sorts of bone deformities um, and I've got a from a in recent interview with Dr. Peter Coldwell. He is a carnivore specialist um, and he tried to explain those health implications of taking cups away from their mothers and bottle feeding them in, in a lot more detail than I could ever do. Um, he is he's one of the best the top um, vet, veterinarians in South Africa. As far as the cubs go, once again, as you take them in from a day for one, they're not getting the benefit of mother's milk, which is the ideal optimal nutrition. They're not getting the antibodies that they need. They don't vaccinate these animals. And the cubs then develop without any immunity. A lot of them die from feline pan leukopenia. They get calici, they get herpes. So they are really compromised. And then that disease remains on the farm, but they don't care. They just let it go. Hey? As far as a milk replacer goes, that's feeding the cubs on whatever milk. So there's a, a few commercial milks available and a lot of the farmers just take cow's milk and mix a bit of egg yolk in it and a bit of glucose. That is so not sufficient. They develop metabolic bone diseases from an early age, so hypovitaminosis A. Esbalac is a canine, a dog milk replacer. So with that, you still have to add extra amino acids like taurine and glycine in it that cats need and the big cats specifically need because they cannot produce that on their own. Like dogs can produce their own taurine, cats cannot. So now you're using a milk replacer, which is expensive. So most of them steer away from it. Only the ones that really want to do well, their cubs want to eat their cubs to survive will give us black, but they still don't add the taurine, they don't add the glycine. And those animals develop neurological issues, they become blind and they become immune compromised. So the milk replacers are vital to when you feed these cubs up until six to eight weeks and then start them on solids and then the appropriate nutrients and supplements after that. So yes, as you can hear, um, there's, there's so many different complications that we don't see as non-experts. We just see maybe a slightly thin cup um, but yeah, there's so many physiological um, issues in their development from a very early age by feeding them on the wrong um, mm. formula. Um, so the fact that these cups are taken away from the mothers too early, they suffer these nutritional deficiency, they get compromised immune system and it makes them much more susceptible to diseases. Now, I hope you can all see this video and Many of you will probably have seen this little video of this poor mm. little cub. Um, so this cub was confiscated by the NSPCA from a breeding farm in the Northwest. Um, and it was actually pretty much straight after this video, it was euthanized. Due to all these things that we've just spoken about, this cub actually contracted meningococcal uh, uh, encephalitis. I can never say that word. It's basically an infection of the brain and the spinal cord mm -hmm. um, that can severely limit their ability to move and even use their tongues to drink and to eat. Mm -hmm. So the 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 physical, the, the diseases associated with those compromised immune systems are just pretty horrific. Yeah, I remember that case coming out. It was, and that video still to this day, it will, you know, tug on those heartstrings. It's horrible to think that someone, someone can do that to an animal. And all I can think is if the breeders can't care enough to, to feed and care for these animals when they're young, what else are they letting fall by the wayside? without taking care of these animals. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, I think it is, and that's why I was saying it 
because of these financial implications to actually give them proper food, to give them proper care, when they're ill to get the vet in to treat them, all cost money. Um, these are commodities. So it really is all the way through their lives, they suffer from all kinds of issues. So for example, we look at these cubs, they're on top of the sort of health issues relating to feeding them, the, the wrong type of milk formula. Very often they're kept in the, the carers, the animal carers home, or they're in outdoor enclosures that are completely inappropriate to such young animals. Um, I heard recently a story of quite young animals that were actually kept outdoors next to a sprinkler system. So these poor animals were actually damp 24 seven and they were ill as a result. Um, so, you know, the, the, just the inappropriate housing can, mm -hmm. can have disastrous impacts on their health as well. Um, often they're not being vaccinated. You know, the simple things like we take our domestic cats to the vet to be vaccinated against the common diseases, we deworm them, all that sort of things just doesn't happen. Um, so, and a lot of the diseases can quite easily be um, avoided if they were given regular veterinary care. Mm. Um, and it's not just the adults that are kept in overcrowded conditions, it's also the youngsters and not just overcrowded, but often unhygienic conditions. Um, and those unhygienic conditions with lots of animals in one place, again, compromised immune systems, it's the perfect conditions to harbour and spread all sorts of diseases. Mm. Um, and I think on top of that, I've, I've shown you a few pictures now, um, just going back to the previous ones. Every cub is the same age. Yeah. You go a little bit further, they grow up, they're still all with the same age group. These cubs are kept in same age groups for pretty much all their lives. They so don't nice have one. that, yeah, they don't mm -hmm. have that social structure of a pride with adults um, where they're being taught how to be a lion. Mm -hmm. um, and then on, on top of that, tigers are being mixed up with lions. Um, so yeah, it's all so unnatural. I mean, that's one thing that I'll never understand. Lions and tigers don't exist on the same continent, let alone in the same habitat. So how you can justify putting two completely different um, animals in the same enclosure is, is beyond me. So what I want to know is why would they keep them in the same enclosures and force them to interact when they would never interact in the wild? Well, I think there is a, a, a few reasons, and one of the reasons is it's easier. Mm. Um, just keep them all together, um, so space. you don't have to have separate enclosures. But on top of that as well, we also um, hybridize these animals, mm. which is hugely problematic. Mm. So, which means that we're actually crossbreeding tigers and lions, um, which again, it's in my personal view, it's completely unethical, um, but it also leads to a compromised health. Mm. So that is another reason why they keep them together so they can actually crossbreed. Mm. On top of that, um, inbreeding is also rife in this industry. Um, where this just the, the whole the compromised health and genetics that leads to all sorts of deformities um, and you can see a few here on these pictures um, so the one on the left um, the little cop was, was actually born with two few toes mm -hmm. um, the poor cop at the top was born without any limbs um, shorter back then front legs, stumpy tails or no tails, floppy ears, very small ears, no teeth, feet that look like flippers, um, you name it. There's so many different deformities that these animals are born with as a result of inbreeding. 
Um, but there's also lots of deformities that we actually can't see that are internal. And again, I would like to play a little soundbite from an interview with Peter Caldwell where he was trying to explain what the inbreeding does on an internal level. As far as inbreeding goes in lions, it's um, quite rife in the, the captive breeding fraternity in that the, first of all, the lion farmers that breed with lions do not have any education relating to genetics and they don't quite understand what inbreeding is. So all the lions in captivity are not DNA'd. For example, we've started a countrywide DNA collection in cheetah. So every cheetah in captivity in the wild, you need to collect blood, hair and sampling for DNA purposes and then it's banked and stored and then they identify what the inbreeding coefficient is and so on. With lions, it, that's a regulation in this country right now with cheetahs. With lions, it's not so. So what they do in captivity is they will breed a male that is really good in breeding with a female. Then the female has cubs and they get to sexual maturity. In captivity, it's probably about two, two and a half years old. That same male, which is now the father, will breed with the daughters and the granddaughters. And they'll carry on using that male and he'll just keep the male with everyone. And that pushes up the inbreeding coefficient to, coefficient to a high level in that then you start getting genetic deformities. But what they don't understand is, with respect to inbreeding is, there's those subtle underlying things that they don't see. It's not like the skew paw, or the curved tail or the two heads or whatever. They're born with very low immunities. They're born with susceptibility to disease. They're susceptible to gastritis. They just carry on breeding father with daughter, granddaughter and great granddaughter. And that is a huge implication in the lion species itself. They're turning the lion species into a weak species up until we're going to get these animals that are just going to be dying like flies from being inbred and also not being able to cope. And whatever they say about releasing the animals back in the wild, releasing one of those inbred animals in the wild, no one wants lions. He's going to put that weak animal in that wild and if that animal does per chance survive, he's going to be spreading those inbred genes all over the wild population. These guys have no idea what they're doing. And as relating to genetics and genes and there's a big difference what we call a phenotypic and genotypic. Genotypic is the genes and on genetic level and phenotypic is what they look like. And they say, my line's looking good, there's nothing wrong. But he doesn't know what's going on on a metabolic and on, on a, a cellular level, what's going on in that line. And that's where they're ignorant and they're messing up the species. As far as um, internal abnormalities relating to genetic issues, I've come across a lot of them. Um, you have what we call hermaphrodites, where uh, one line has male and female sex organs internally. We've had brain deformities and we've had cere cerebellar uh, underdevelopment, spinal cord issues, and those are all inbred internal situations. We've had um, intestinal issues, we've had atresia ani where the anus hasn't developed so they cannot defecate. I'll be honest, that all sounds horrendous and I mean Peter touches on the inbreeding affecting one of the myths that we that we touched on two weeks ago of, mm. of releasing back into the wild and this breeding being for conservation. With, with this many potential issues that can arise my first thought is it cannot possibly for, be for conservation. Um, but my question is, based on these issues, surely most of these animals are put down at some point. So they, they're, I mean, they're, they're dying anyway. Um, but do we have any idea of how many cubs die as a result of this intensive breeding and the inbreeding? No, we don't, um, because there's no statistics held um, within this. The, the, the stats coming out of this industry are very sketchy. Um, we don't even know how many animals there are in total, let alone statistics on, for example, cup mortality. Um, we really have no idea and we're completely dependent on anecdotal information. But that kind of anecdotal information has given us a pretty good insight that it can be not everywhere, but it can be very high. 
um, and it can be as high as 40 to 60 percent, which to me is just horrific when you stop to think how many cubs need to die in order to pet that one lion or tiger. Yeah, I mean, if we if we've got, let's say we go with the minister's stats, seven thousand nine hundred lions. How many had to die for those seven thousand nine hundred to be the ones that survived? That's incredible. Exactly, and and the the picture at the top is actually a picture of a freezer full of lion and tiger cub carcasses. Um, this is a fairly common thing mm. on on breeding farms as well. So yeah, it's not a one off. It it happens pretty often across mm. the whole industry. So okay, so that's the cubs. So let's move on. What about the the welfare issues associated with adults and sub adults? In this industry well it's pretty much it just carries on just on a slightly different level with a slightly different issues um you know something we touched on last week as well the rapid breeding cycle the fact that we take these cubs away from their mothers uh, means that these females uh, go back in eustress very quickly. Um, they can have up to five times uh, as many litters as they would in the wilds. Um, just the fact that they have that many pregnancies, that many more pregnancies that in the wild already creates all sorts of um, physical uh, health issues for these mothers, uh, not even to speak of the psychological issues of having their cubs taken away all the time because no. they fall pregnant, they have cubs and they're gone. Mm -hmm. um, they fall pregnant again, they give birth, cubs are gone again. So these women, these, <laughs> you know, these female lions, mm -hmm. they are prepared to be a mother. Um, they can never be a mother. Um, so yeah, the psychological issues are pretty horrendous too. Um, on top of that, we're talking commercial breeding. We're talking intensive breeding. Um, so there are minimum enclosure requirements, for example. So if we're looking at the camps they're being kept in, there are minimum uh, enclosure requirements for indigenous um, captive predators, but they vary between the nine provinces. So, for example, Limpopo has no prescribed minimum requirements. And when we talk exotic species like tigers, again, no minimum requirements at all. Mm -hmm. So what we find is that many of these breeding farms are massively undersized and overcrowded camps. Um, you know, a camp of, say, 60 by 40 meters, which is a fairly small camp for, for predators, holding like 30, 40 lions is really no exception. As you can see on this picture here, the barren, often very unsuitable substrate, lack of shelter, providing no shade, no shelter from the elements. Um, sometimes camps get flooded and these animals are standing in water for days on end, giving them all sorts of infections on their feet and sometimes even cold and death. Um, this, and talking about enrichment, there's nothing, um, enrichment doesn't exist on, mm. um, on commercial breeding farms. No, I'm sure. I mean, lions in the wild get most of their enrichment from playtime as cubs, playing with each other, play fighting, play hunting. Um, and as adults, they get the enrichment from their meal times, where um, it's the act of hunting and the bonding ritual of feeding with the pride and having that um, argy bargy um, with, with the older and the younger lions. So, you know, lions in the wild will, will eat whenever they're hungry, which isn't always every day, but it's consistent enough to keep them going. Um, so I can almost answer this question myself before <laughs> I even ask you, but what is the situation when it comes to feeding these lions on these commercial farms? Yeah, the, 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 the feeding of predators is obviously expensive, so they are being fed when meat is available. Very often this consists of donated chickens from battery farms. Um, chicken meat uh, doesn't provide them with the right uh, protein levels and the right nutrients. So again, uh, it's about the wrong food for these animals. 
Also battery chickens may even contain things like antibiotics, growth hormones and other additives. Um, I know from a story of a lion at Lion's Rock, one of, of the, um, 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 what, what is it called? Um, Centuries. <laughs> Centuries, thank you, couldn't <laughs> think <centuries>. of the words. <laughs> they actually had a male lion um, without a mane um, because it was actually fed on dairy cattle with elevated hormone levels. So all that sort of things happen. When there is sufficient chicken, they're probably fed maybe two to three chickens per day and they're just being thrown off the back of a bucky. Um, you can see this picture here, these guys, they stand on the back of a vehicle, they're just throwing these chickens into the camps and it's basically the fittest, the strongest lions, they get the best meal. And it's yeah, no surprise, uh, lots of fights as well, obviously when, when that kind of feeding occurs. But in very lean times, when they don't have a lot of meat coming in, then they can go without um, food for two, three weeks. That leads to malnutrition and sometimes even cannibalism. Um, and again, also that irregular feeding pattern can create health issues as well, such as liver and kidney problems. Um, and I think also the problem is with these camps is that they're very poorly designed. So they don't have feeding camps. Um, that makes the cleaning of these enclosures not only difficult, but very dangerous for the staff working there. Um, and it means that the camps are, are not often uh, fair, uh, cleaned at all. And, and, and they're often littered with fecal matter, with decaying food. Um, you can see lots of, of feathers here that are not being eaten. There's a lack of hygiene protocols altogether. The, complete absence of prescribed methods and cleaning materials to use. Um, and that often leads to transmission of infectious diseases between the camps. Um, water troughs are often filled daily, but only cleaned maybe once a week. So often the, even the troughs are, are found to be dirty and mm. sometimes even dry. Um, so yeah, it's sometimes even very basic things that these animals um, don't get. Um, and, and this all leads or can lead to zoonosis because the majority of these commercial pre predator breeding facilities, they, as I said, they lack any kind of hygiene protocols to prevent the spread of uh, infectious diseases and potentially zoonotic diseases. So for exam example, these stepping stones where farmers disinfect, the farm workers disinfect their shoes between enclosures, they just don't exist. Um, and that all helps in the transmission of, of diseases. Now the animals on, on the left, um, they you hardly recognize them as lions because they hardly have any fur left and that is actually as a result of untreated mange. Mm. Um, so those are the sort of diseases that just go right through a whole farm uh, when it happens because they're untreated, they're kept untreated and there's no protocols to try and prevent the um, the spread uh, between the, the camps. Mm. Um, so mange, for example, it can be very painful because they lose their fur, they get cracked skin. Uh, as a result of the cracked skin, they get infections. They have no skin, no fur left, so they get sunburned. So it's extremely uncomfortable and painful for these animals as well. And of course, you know, in this industry where we encourage the public to interact with these animals as well mm -hmm. and we have farm workers working with these animals on a close um, personal basis the the, trans the the potential of transmission of zoonotic diseases between the animals and people is is really quite substantial mm -hmm. um, and yeah as i said we are encouraging the public to interact with cubs, to to walk with the bigger um, lions. Mm -hmm. um, it's just asking for for trouble and yeah. for 
And especially when we talk about the farm workers as well, who are involved in, for example, the slaughter and the preparation of the bones that are exported for the consumption of traditional medicine practice in Asia, um, they're also at risk of uh, zoonotic diseases. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, and we all know what, what the transmission of zoonotic diseases results in. It results in a worldwide pandemic. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I mean, you know, the, these are these places that we've been speaking about and majority of the pictures that we've shown are on um, commercial breeding farms and, it, you know, the, 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 the health issues that they present. But what about places that are open to visitors? Um, surely they have some kind of welfare provisions in place so that their animals can look um, and, and be as healthy as possible if they're coming into contact with humans every day. Yes, no, it's true. And, and um, I think the, the, it's a very strange thing. These, these facilities that are open to the public, it's a bit of a yin and yang situation because they're, they're keep, keeping up appearances. Um, so the animals that the public interacts with and the public sees, they are reasonably well looked after. But then there's very often a behind the scene um, situation as well where it's just the same as it mm. as it, on any sort of commercial breeding operation um, but if we're looking at specifically at those um, facilities that are open to the public we're looking at for example a petting enclosure mm. um, these cubs they are interacted with handles by the paying public for up to eight to ten hours a day seven days a week mm. they're actually being worked. Yeah. Um, the daily number of paying visitors can easily amount to 100 people interacting with these cubs um, or even more when they are sub-adults. Mm -hmm. So that obviously generates a substantial amount of money, that's why they do, yeah. but these cubs are young, they should be sleeping, they should be playing, they shouldn't be handled and petted and poked and prodded. Mm -hmm. um, eight to ten hours a day seven days a week mm. um, and then to create these well-behaved because as you can see the photo on the right um, these ladies were pretty yeah pretty well behaved but um, near adult mm. animals to actually create those well-behaved alliance um, for these photo opportunities um, they go through brutal training program mm. And that is just no different from uh, the way a circus animal is being trained. Mm. Um, and they use, the lip, you know, they use pepper sprays, they use sticks to condition them, not to bite, not to jump, not to run, not to use their claws. Mm. And why do you think these visitors are given a stick when they go on walks? Mm. It's just to remind the lions to behave. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's um, there's different kind of cruelty, but still um, considerable welfare issues involved. And yeah. strangely enough, on the public side, and that's something that I just want to quickly touch on as well, where we've seen on the commercial breeding side, where you can get these very uh, undernourished, very thin. Um, emaciated lions, we can find the opposite happening um, when we deal with the public side and you find these animals that are just obese and that is because the guides very often walk around with a bucket of snacks all day long um, because that is the way to lure the animal to the fence yes. so the visitors get a better view. Mm. So yeah, um, different sort of set of of issues, but nonetheless still still issues. And I think, and this is what I want to to leave you with, is the big question: why? Because let's not forget that the reason why we put these animals through all this is so they can be shot for their trophy or be slaughtered for their bones at the end of their pretty miserable captive life. So, yeah. Sorry, I hope I haven't depressed everybody too much, <laughs> but I think I'm so passionate about this. I think it's so important to understand that 
The issues with our captive lions is not just about that endpoint where we kill them in unethical captive hunts or where we slaughter them for their bones. It's actually all through their lives. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to understand that there's there's those links and that's what bloodlines tries to do is is educate the public on the links between the cub petting and the bone trade for example yes so thank you very much louise um i I don't think it's a very happy subject to be presenting (laughs) on um but as you said you're passionate about it and i do think everybody needs to know so there are some very interesting questions that have come through Um, The first one that I would like to answer live, as I said, I don't know if if anyone hadn't joined us yet um, earlier, but we will will be answering some of the Q&A questions now. Any that we don't get to because of time, um, we will collate in a document and send the answers to everybody who's attended afterwards. Um, So the very first question um, that, that I'd like to ask is, um, from Paul, he said he remembers the case of a lion breeder in the Northwest where the NSPCA in- inspected the, the breeding farm. They found about 100 lions in deplorable conditions. Um, he believed they rescued some, some cubs. Do we know what happened to those cubs? Yes, um, we do know. And um, let me quickly go back to this little video because it wasn't one of the cubs but it was the cubs that were rescued were in a very similar situation where they also had this infection of the brain and the spinal cords Mm -hmm. um two um two of the cubs were rescued by the nspca and dr peter coldwell actually looked after them for months Um, They literally had to be rehabilitated. It was all linked to highly compromised immune systems. They are doing pretty well. They are actually living um, a very nice life together. It's Ivana and Carlos. Um, They're living at Panthera Africa and they are really doing very well considering where they were because um, yeah, Dr. Peter Kolfel, he actually said they weren't sure whether Ivana was even going to make the first night. Um, they were in a very bad uh, state when, um, when they arrived at his clinic. Um, but they are still improving. They're still a little bit wobbly on their legs, mm-hmm. um, but they are becoming very beautiful uh, cubs. Um, Carlos has started to roar even. He's starting to grow a little bit of a mane, you know, when they get a little bit of a <laughs> leak. And, yeah, so they are actually doing really quite well, um, considering a where they came from. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Um, so I'm going to ask, we're almost, we've gone over the 45 minutes, but if everyone doesn't mind, there's another two questions that I'd like to ask live. The first one is from Makaya. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, could you please explain the lion bone trade legislation and how that impacts captive lion welfare? That's a very good question um, because let me answer, answer the last part first. Um, when we breed lions specifically and only for their bones, it doesn't really matter what they look like. Their physical appearance doesn't matter whatsoever. They are literally a bag of bones. So that means that welfare is really bottom of the list of priorities. So that first of all, how the the lion bone legislation works is that on um, during COP17 in 2016, it was agreed that there was an amendment made to the uh, uh, appendix two regulations of lion specifically for south africa's captive population and that agreement was that south africa could set a lion bone export quota um, but that was only for their captive population so that does not apply to the 
wild population. Mm -hmm. And so far, South Africa has set an export quota of 800 lion skeletons per year. Um, although there's been a little bit of a snag with um, the, the um, ruling of the High Court last year. But yeah, it was actually agreed. The legislation in itself was agreed at CITES. I hope that uh, that answered your question. Perfect. Thanks. Um, the, the last question I'm going to actually um, join two questions together. So the first question is, does stress play a role in the spreading of disease? If so, what are the stress factors? And the other aspect of, um, I believe to be part of a similar question is, can TB be transmitted? So tuberculosis be transmitted between lions and humans and vice versa? Oh, um, yes, <laughs> very good questions. Um, stress, we do believe stress is a, a factor in the uh, transmission of zoonotic diseases. Um, and one of the reasons why that is believed is because stress, again, plays a role in lowering that immunity. Mm -hmm. So when an animal... Uh, animal's immune system is lowered and look at us human beings as well when you're really stressed your mm. immune system also goes down mm. the same happens with animals and then they're they're more susceptible to diseases um, and if those stress situations are created uh, for example by creating unnatural conditions or putting too many animals together in close proximity, putting different species together in close proximity. And that is also what we see on these commercial breeding farms where we, for example, have a, a, a camp with lions, the one with tigers, um, wild dogs next door, you know, all these animals would either not even be on the same continent or would in nature completely avoid each other. Mm -hmm. I've seen, uh, facilities where you have uh, predator and prey species next to each yes, other. Yeah. Uh, that just obviously creates a huge amount of stress for, for animals. Um, the second part of the question about TB, um, we do believe it can, but and, and TB does exist in both the wild and the captive population. And we do believe it is transmissible between animals and humans. Not sure whether it's the other way around as well, but I, I would have thought there is a potential because we've seen that the coronavirus has also been transmitted from people to big cats. So mm -hmm. I think there is a possibility, but there isn't really enough research to say yes or no. Also, there isn't enough testing done within the captive population to know how much TB is within the captive population. So there's a lot of gaps in our knowledge, to be totally honest. Yeah. But we believe there is a definite uh, possibility of TB being transmissible from big cats, from lions, to um, humans. And there's definitely also the possibility of transmitting TB from the captive to the wild population when they are in, in close proximity, which is also a, a possibility. Perfect, thanks Lou. So there are a few more questions, but we have run out of time. Um, so we will collate all the questions there. There are some really, really great ones. Um, and we'll submit, we'll email everybody a document with those answers. But what we would like to highlight is one of one or two of the questions that have come through is what you can do. Um, so the, the first thing, the main thing is to keep it wild and keep your volunteering wild um, with genuine conservation organizations. Um, visit our many amazing game reserves, especially after this pandemic when they start opening, they, they will need um, as much support as, as possible. And the other thing you can do is spread the word um, on social media at get-togethers on your, your family Zoom quiz nights. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. you know, spread the word about all of this. Um, you know, we need all the help we can get. 
Um, the third point is to host a screening of the Blood Lions film. Um, if anyone would like to host a screening, you're welcome to email us. Um, there is a watch the film tab on our website um, that you can pop over there and have a look. Um, some other more active things that you can do is you can sign our pledges. We have a tourism pledge, the Born to Live Wild pledge, um, that has, I think as of this morning, 196 signatories um, from all over the world. Um, there's also our youth pledge for those of us um, who are con still considered youth. I'm, I'm still there, thank goodness, um, where you can pledge yeah, yeah, to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nudge, nudge. Um, <laughs> the youth pledge, you can pledge not to interact with, with animals um, and to help us spread the word. And then we do also have a ban wildlife markets pledge at the moment that is quite um, current. So you can pop over there. I think the link for that is, is on our websites and it's also on our many of our social media um, posts. The last two parts that you can do, you can contact the media, you can talk, contact us and ask us for contacts um, if you'd like. And the last one is to, to donate. Don't